And you, you can have your main event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days or Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today, we are discussing Season 6, Episode 23, Fonzie's Funeral, Part 2. Okay, Peter, tell us what happens at Fonzie's Funeral, Part 2. Oh boy. We open with a recap of the events of last episode. In Part 1, Fonzie was repairing a hearse and discovered counterfeit money hidden in the coffin. Ending with Fonzie's garage once again exploding. Richie is horrified. Until a very much alive Fonzie stumbles out. Having been hiding behind his address book at the time. His address book is not actually a book. It's a six foot tall file cabinet. So yeah, it makes sense that he would still be alive. Kind of. Don't overthink it. The two embrace and literally jump for joy until Fonzie remembers to be cool. Back at the Heavenly Slumber Funeral Parlor, the Candyman's henchmen report back to their boss that Fonzie is definitely dead now. We blew him up, Candyman! (laughs) He orders them to go to the secret room and have the tied-up Ralph and Potsy call home, so no one will worry about their disappearance. Ralph, claiming his last name is Cunningham, calls Marion and Howard instead of his own parents to tell them he won't be home tonight. Hello? Oh, hello, Ralph! Howard, he called me Mom. (laughs) As Howard hangs up, Richie and Fonzie run inside the house. Richie explains that the counterfeiters tried to blow Fonzie up. Well, now, how do you know it was them? Because I overheard him when I was laying in the casket, Dad. <laughs> Richie goes to call the police, and Marion goes to make Fonzie hot chocolate. He's under a lot of stress right now, so he's going to need at least four marshmallows. The doorbell rings. It's Peterson from the Treasury Department. I, I have a sad duty to perform. He's there to tell them Arthur Fonzarelli was blown up, and is as surprised as anyone to see Fonzie there in one piece. Howard mentions that Ralph called up earlier pretending to be Ralph Cunningham. Rishi puts two and two together. Ralph and Posse were with him at the funeral parlor, and the counterfeiters could have gotten their hands on them. Fonzie initially wants to go beat up the counterfeiters. We're going down there. We're going to add three more stiffs to their inventory. Yeah, that's a good idea. Until he thinks better of it. Everyone thinks he's dead. What's the best way to get into a funeral parlor? Having a funeral. And since, according to Richie, the next shipment of counterfeit money is going to Detroit... No, not Detroit! No! They'll say the late Fonzie wanted to be buried in Detroit. The next day at the funeral parlor, the counterfeiters report that they'll finish printing the latest shipment by 1 o'clock. They won't be able to ship it to Detroit without a body in the coffin. And conveniently, that's right when Marion, Howard, and Richie show up. Boss, how are we going to send the shipment? We ain't got a body in the coffin. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? Saying they'd like to bury a friend. The candy man initially tries to refer them to another funeral parlor, claiming to be all booked up. But Richie says it would be a short ceremony and the actual burial would be in Detroit. Detroit! (laughs) He puts a pair of boots on the table, claiming them to be all that's left of Arthur Bonzarelli. They want to have the funeral as soon as possible, but there should be a period of mourning, so how about after lunch? The candy man says that sounds perfect. My assistant will give you all the arrangements. Come, Eugene! When asked if they're Fonzie's next of kin, Marion says they're making arrangements on behalf of Fonzie's mother and escorts in Fonzie in a gray wig, black mourning attire, and a questionable high-pitched Italian accent. I am the man that is going to make the arrangements for my son. As Sticky the Henchman shows Widow Fonzarelli the options for caskets, Ralph and Posse fruitlessly try to get free in the secret room. That afternoon, the funeral has begun. Richie has to turn away a gaggle of girls looking to mourn Fonzie, and there are even more outside. This is the first funeral they ever had to have a uh, parade permit. Marion, Howard, and Joni get up to feign mourning, and Marion, who doesn't want to let a good funeral go to waste, bursts into tears. Peterson reports to the Cunninghams that they need to stall, having still not found the printing press on the premises. Meanwhile, the Candyman tells Sticky to speed things up so they don't miss the 4 o'clock train. A group of girls, including Lori Beth and Jennifer, show up to pay their respects. His boots look so peaceful. One girl tells Widow Fonzarelli she's sorry, and Fonzie embraces her and presses kisses to her jaw until she knows that the Widow kisses like her son. Arnold shows up, and he and Al pay their respects together. How's business, Al? Don't ask. Arnold remembers the last thing Fonzie ever said to him when Arnold was backing out of Arnold's parking lot for the last time. Don't run over my motorcycle! Next is Officer Kirk. Come to pay your last respects, Officer Kirk. I came to make sure you buried the troublemaking hood. 
Carmine Ragusa literally dances his way in and says to Fonzie that's how he knows he would have wanted it. Lenny and Squiggy bring in a flower arrangement that says, good luck at your new location, and Squiggy calls Fonzie the nicest guy would ever beat him up. Laverne and Shirley are weeping as they arrive. The big boss must have really wanted him in a hurry, Laverne. Pulled him right out of his boots. <laughs> And Laverne recounts how Fonzie hickeyed his initials on her neck. Laverne tries to steal one of Fonzie's boots, and Shirley has to talk her out of it. Then Laverne tries to take her sweater off to leave Fonzie something. Shirley stops her from going topless in the funeral home, and instead rips the L off of Laverne's sweater and places it on the boots. After the cast of Laverne and Shirley leave, not before looking rather suspiciously at Widow Fonzarelli, the counterfeiters try to end the ceremony early. Finish this ceremony! Richie tries to stall with a hymn, until Sicky tells him, hymns are extra. Back in the secret room, Potsy wriggles an arm out of the ropes to loosen his gag and tell Ralph to stop yelling at him. How come your voice isn't muffled like mine? Because I'm tired of talking through this gag, that's why! In the empty funeral home, the candy man checks on the counterfeit money in the casket and says, Better Fonzie than them. So long, chump. Then Fonzie opens the coffin from inside, grabs the candy man, and says in his widow Fonzarelli voice, The chump lives! He pushes the candy man into the trick wall, and out come Ralph and Potsy, who got out of their ropes. They show him how the door works, and the candy man's henchmen show up to stop Fonzie. A sticky Eugene! A mechanic alive! He pops into the secret door, and they follow him. Richie Peterson and the other treasury agents show up, and upon hearing that Fonzie is with the candy man, says he can't handle him alone. Ralph and Potsy knowingly say, No, the Fonz can. can. Sure enough, the secret door turns around to show the candy man, Sticky, and Eugene in an unconscious pile. At Arnold's, they hold a welcome back to life party for Fonzie. In honor of Fonzie being alive, we're staying open one extra hour tonight! Fonzie reconciles with a line of girls. Richie and Lori Beth and Potsy and Jennifer leave for inspiration point. Fonzie magnanimously allows the dateless Ralph to make out with one of the girls in line. Thank you, Peter. That was Fonzie's Funeral, Part 2, which first aired back on February 27th, 1979. Happy Days was followed that night by a new Laverne and Shirley, in which Squiggy falls in love with a gold digger. Look at the way she is. She leaves the toilet like a gazelle. CBS aired the made-for-TV movie Women at West Point. About the first women to attend the famous military academy, it starred Happy Days' own Linda Pearl, along with Leslie Ackerman and Jameson Parker. There was one big change in 1976 when West Point went co-ed. Mary Costello is one of this new breed of cadet. And NBC aired an episode of a new show called Stop Susan Williams. Susan Williams is a reporter hot on the trail of an international conspiracy so deadly it could end the world. With Susan Anton as a reporter who uncovers a global conspiracy, it was part of a revolving series called Cliffhangers. In this episode, Susan investigates her brother's death, which the authorities insist was an accident, but which she thinks was murder. So, Peter, of those three choices, what are you watching? I want to see Cliffhangers. I do, too. This was NBC's attempt to get the cliffhanger or serial format back onto television. Unfortunately, opposite Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley, cliffhangers died after just a couple of months. Fonzie's Funeral Part 2 was directed by Jerry Paris, and it was written by Michael Lohman, who also wrote Part 1. This was Michael's last Happy Days script. He would go on to write and produce such sitcoms as Newhart and Valerie. I'm so happy he went out with a bang. If you're going to write a final script for Happy Days, Fonzie's Funeral Part 2 might as well be it. To me, it's like somebody casually tossing a match over their shoulder and then the whole building behind them blows up and they just walk away calmly from it. And we Uh, love him for it. As for guest stars, this is the most guest star heavy episode in Happy Days history. Obviously, Cliff Emick as Candyman, Chino Conforti as Sticky, Richard Mall as Eugene, and John Moskal Jr. as Peterson are all back from last week. Did any of those four guys make a new impression on you this week? The Candyman is still a ridiculous cartoon human being. Eugene got significantly less to do than he did last week. I think he had like three lines total. And Peterson, still a pretty thankless role. Not as thankless as the other Treasury agent who doesn't get a name or any lines. But he does get to press his body against Peterson's very closely in a way that feels kind of unnecessary for just whispering in his ear about not finding the printing press. Other returning guest stars include Linda Goodfriend as Lori Beth, Lori Mahaffey as Jennifer, Ed Peck as Officer Kirk, Eddie Mecca as Carmine Ragusa. Well, Fonz, that was from the big ragu to you. I know that's the way you would have wanted it. 
Shirley Kirkus as Blossom, Pat Morita as Arnold, Penny Marshall as Laverne, and Cindy Williams as Shirley. Who among those made the strongest impression on you? I'm going to have to go with Laverne and Shirley. They were delightful in this episode. I was so happy to have them here. I love the fact that this episode involves Laverne almost going topless because she's in such a state of grief. And Shirley has to be the one to say, no, don't do that. No, are you nuts? This is a holy place. This is a holy place. This is a holy place. That was one of my favorite lines from this episode. Especially since I don't think that's true. It's just a funeral parlor, as far as she knows. It's not a church. Almost the entire cast of Laverne and Shirley is here. One of my favorite moments of that is when they are walking out the door as a group, and then they're not quite convinced of what just happened, so they all look over their shoulders simultaneously. That was a great little piece of physical acting. Michael Pataki and Ken Lerner filmed a cameo as the Malachi brothers, but this was cut, so Ooh. Ooh, we were denied a Malachi Brothers cameo. New guest stars this week include Michael McKean as Lenny and David Lander as Squiggy. This is the only time Lenny and Squiggy ever turned up on Happy Days. Michael McKean is an incredibly accomplished actor, comedian, and musician from New York. His career in comedy began when he met David Lander at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Once they relocated to Los Angeles, Lander and McKean formed a comedy troupe called The Credibility Gap with Harry Shearer. <laughs> This in turn led to them being cast on Laverne and Shirley. Michael's films include Clue, This is Spinal Tap, Used Cars, Best in Show, A Mighty Wind, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Gary Marshall's Young Doctors in Love, and many more. On TV, Michael is currently known as Chuck McGill on Better Call Saul. Don't you know by now this is real? I feel this. It's a physical response to stimuli. It's not a quirk. But he's had recurring parts on Breeders, Grace and Frankie, Harvey Birdman, Grand, The X-Files, Tracy Takes On, Dream On, and Sessions. He was also a cast member on Saturday Night Live. So, Peter, what did you think of Michael McKean as Lenny? I love him so much. In this episode, he doesn't really get a lot to do, but I'm just happy that he's here. It was great just to see him on Happy Days for a few minutes. David L. Lander was also from New York. Well, Michael grew up on Long Island. David was from Brooklyn. Before Laverne and Shirley, David had guest starred on Love American Style, Rhoda, Barney Miller, and The Bob Newhart Show, and been the voice of Jerry Lewis on Will the Real Jerry Lewis Please Sit Down. Rhonda will probably win that beauty contest and go to Hollywood, and I'll never see her again. With Michael McKean, he appeared in such films as 1941, Used Cars, and Cracking Up. His extensive cartoon voiceover work includes Who Frame Roger Rabbit, A Bug's Life, The Simpsons, SpongeBob SquarePants, Batman the Animated Series, Galaxy High, Oswald, and lots of Garfield specials. He played John Arbuckle's brother, Doc Boy. Oh! He- Doc Boy! How's my favorite brother? Don't call me Doc Boy. And you've probably forgotten I'm your only brother. David's other TV credits include Twin Peaks, Star Trek The Next Generation, Married with Children, The Nanny, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. His film credits include Scary Movie, A League of Their Own, directed by Penny Marshall, and Dr. Dude Little 2. David died in late 2020. What did you think of David L. Lander as Squiggy? He got one of my favorite one-liners in the episode, how Fonzie was the nicest guy who ever beat him up. That was one of my favorite lines as well. He was the nicest guy who ever beat me up. David Lander obviously having a lot of fun here, and it was great to have him here. As for songs this week, there was a lot of unidentifiable organ music at the funeral home. All I heard were just chords and no melodies. (laughs) Did you recognize anything being played at the funeral home at all? I did not. Jennifer remarks, they're playing all of Fonzie's favorite songs, which if they are, I could not identify any of them. Maybe it's just hard to tell what songs are being played when they're on an organ. At Arnold's, Ron Howard sings a bit of Blueberry Hill. I found my three <laughs> This is cut from the syndicated version. As for cultural and historical references, the addresses that Sticky and Eugene give the Candyman are fictitious. Conzarelli the mechanic is now at the corner of 4th and Main. And 5th and Main <laughs> and 6th and Main. <laughs> There is a 4th Street and a Main Street in Milwaukee, but they do not intersect, as far as I can tell. Howard is seen reading a novel called Death Hits High C. I can find no evidence of this book existing anywhere. Maybe it was just a prop. Technically speaking, Fonzie's boots are being placed in a casket rather than a coffin. Sir, we prefer the term casket to coffin and monument to tombstone. 
We have all the leading brands of anti-stink spray. Both are boxes meant for storing a corpse, but coffins are six-sided with an oblong design. Caskets are rectangular. Oh, hey, I learned something new. Blossom says to the widow Fonzarelli, what soft lips you have, to which the widow replies, it's all the better to give you a kiss. They're reenacting a famous scene from the 17th century fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood. Goodness, what big eyes you have. The better to see you with, said the wolf. The dialogue between the wolf and the girl may have been influenced by Norse mythology. There is a story in which Thor impersonates the goddess Freya in order to fool some giants who have stolen his hammer and demand a bride in return. When the giants are suspicious of the bride's masculine appearance and mannerisms, Loki makes up some cover story about Freya just being tired after days without rest. That entire scene is so weird. Fonzie, you can't just not think about sex until the funeral is over and the counterfeiters are no longer trying to murder you. He is an exceptionally flirty and amorous widow Fonzarelli. Yeah, Blossom has no idea what's going on. She just thinks that the mother of the guy she has casual sex with is hitting on her. What the f***? It makes it a very, very odd scene. Lenny says that it's weird how Fonzie's boots died with him off. The expression, die with your boots on, goes back to the American West in the mid-19th century. It means to die while working or while in action. Last year, he died with his boots on. Shirley mentions a great stag line in the sky. Do you want Fonzie to stand barefoot on that great stag line in the sky, huh? A stag line is a group of dateless men at a dance or a social gathering. And in the last scene, Joni jokes about having a date with Ricky Nelson. Right, Ralph. Right after I tell you about my date with Ricky Nelson. Ricky was the son of entertainers Ozzie and Harriet Nelson and was a cast member on the long-running TV sitcom The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. In addition, Ricky had a very successful career as a rock singer with such hits as Traveling Man and Hello, Mary Lou. And for a second, Ralph and Chachi are halfway convinced that Joni is really dating Ricky Nelson. She's dating Ricky Nelson? (laughs) They have their potsy moment. Other observations. Who is that narrating at the beginning of the show? Is it Al? Fonzie decides to return the hearse before going to the police. I don't know. Normally, Al narrates the flashbacks when there's multi-part episodes, but it sounds a little too serious to be Al. Yeah, I guess it's because in the last couple of episodes, it was diegetic narration. Like, Al got a postcard explaining what was going on in Hollywood. We came over here for Fonzie's screen test, but Fonzie didn't get it. They liked my apple pie face instead. Or it was Al writing home to talk about the stuff in Colorado. And here it's just someone describing what happened in the last episode. So it might just be some random voice actor they got. I'm really starting to appreciate that bright blue carpet at the Heavenly Slumber funeral home. It really cheers up the mourners and makes the funeral a little less depressing. What did you think of that carpeting? Interesting choice. I wonder if it was put in to subtly indicate that this funeral home was not entirely legitimate. Last time, you wondered if they were putting on actual funerals at this funeral home. And the vibe I got from this is that they aren't. And every time someone comes to them to say, hey, we need a funeral, they say, uh, we're all booked up. We'll refer you to someone else. And the only reason they go along with it is because this will give them an excuse to send a casket to Detroit. Which makes it all the more odd that their funeral home is this gigantic two-story mansion. Yeah, Uh, I guess being counterfeiters, they have cash to burn. I like that Widow Fonzarelli steals a pen from the funeral home. My pen! My pen! My pen is missing! It was a nice touch, and I kind of hope it was improvised by Henry Winkler. It's great. You know what it reminded me of was there's a movie that Johnny Knoxville made. Maybe it's in one of the Jackass movies where... (laughs) There's a scene in which Johnny Knoxville puts on old age makeup and he just goes into a convenience store and just starts stealing everything and stuffing it into his coat. Because who's going to stop an old man? Exactly. That's how you treat an old man. Yeah, yeah, go. An old man that steals, I can't believe it. Chronologically, I guess Arnold is still living in Japan at this point in his life. He won't start working in Las Vegas for quite a while. He's working in Las Vegas as of Blansky's Beauties. But isn't that where Arnold is supposed to be at this point? He's supposed to be living in Japan? I think so. It's very, very difficult to figure out the life of Arnold Takahashi. And is it really possible that no one happened to sit in that one particular chair during the funeral? 
I guess it was too far away from the funeral proper for them. If you want to like stay there and more, and I guess you'd pick one that's facing the casket. My own experience at funerals is that obviously there are chairs right up by the casket, but there are chairs everywhere and people tend to spread out so they can have their own little private conversations in different corners. And sometimes people just want to be alone for a few minutes. I think given the amount of real estate we have here, someone was bound to sit in one of those chairs and discover the secret passageway. Well, that just makes it more absurd that the treasury agents never discovered that passage. (laughs) Those guys were not doing their job very well. So, Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions? I really liked Shirley's funeral outfit. She's wearing this kind of floral, dark dress, which looked really nice. She had a black kerchief tied around her head like she's a Slavic grandmother or something, which I thought was a very nice touch. What did Lenny and Squiggy wear to this thing? They were wearing formal shirts under their regular jackets. So Lenny's wearing his red kind of letterman jacket and Squiggy is wearing a leather jacket. That's a pretty cool look too. They're delightful. So Peter, did you have any other observations that you wanted to make about Fonzie's funeral part two? I really did not like the ending where Fonzie basically gives Blossom to Ralph to make out with. Mouth, get over here. Yeah, Fonz? Take over for me, will you? Bless you, Fonz. That just was really gross to me. That was to me, too. And in fact, I thought they missed a grand opportunity for a joke at the end, which was when Fonzie leaves the line and places Ralph at the beginning of the line. I thought all the girls should start just grumbling and then walk off in disgust. (laughs) But they didn't do it. And I thought, oh, why didn't you do that? That would have been a huge final last laugh for the episode. As you know, oftentimes the tags for these episodes are cut in syndication and there are edits that don't even have the tags at all. Although every once in a while there's a tag that completes the story or has something really important plot-wise. This was much more of just a throwaway moment that I think could have been thrown away. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old timeless question. Was this episode any good? This episode was delightful. Oh my god. This makes the shark jumping episode look like a gritty down-to-earth drama. This is so stupid. I loved it. It was like a Scooby-Doo episode. In a big mansion like this, there's gotta be a secret passage. Like that's it? A secret passage? Let's look for one. Yeah. I think that in comparison even to part one, this was even bigger. I think if Jerry Paris was giving any direction to the actors, he was saying, just yell all your lines, ham it up like never before. Candyman, you need to laugh evilly more. (laughs) I love Candyman's laugh. It is in no way like a human being's laugh. There's nothing normal or human about it, but that's what makes it great. It's not an expression of good humor. It's an expression of pure evil. Exactly. It is like something that you would see in a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. This whole thing, they are not shy about punctuating actions with a bolt of lightning and a dramatic shock of music on the soundtrack. Dun, dun, dun. I think we've left behind the standard of good and bad. The traditional meanings of good and bad are kind of meaningless in an episode like Fonzie's Funeral. This has nothing to do with real human beings. It has nothing to do really even with nostalgia or... Or the 50s or 60s. It doesn't really have anything to do with anything. It's just a big cartoon. You have basically two choices. You can close yourself off from it and say, this is silly. This could never happen. This is all ridiculous. Or you can go with it and just enjoy the jokes. Just enjoy the overacting. Just enjoy the absurdity of it all. Just vibe with it, man. Fonzie's Funeral Part 2, I think, is even crazier than Part 1. So both are highly, highly recommended. So, Peter, how can people find out about all the wonderful things that we are doing? Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfranc. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at thesedaysareours.libson.com. And they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at thesedaysareourspodcast at gmail.com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Well, after this two-parter, we need a more calm, down-to-earth episode. So next week, Mork returns in the fifth anniversary show. This is one I am very much looking forward to so see you later alligator in a while crocodile if you just ain't got nobody since you gone and lost your head rigor mortis will set in daddy jack you dead what's the use of having muscles when your life hangs by a thread if you ain't got no red car puzzles jack you dead you've been always kicking 
But you stubbed your toes When you ups and kicks the bucket Just like old man Mose When you get no kicks from loving And the news begin to spread All the cats will holler Murder! Jack, you dead All the breath is leaked out of you When your friends gather around the bed And look at you and say mm, 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 Don't he look natural When that happens to you, daddy Jack, you dead. The chump lives.